So we're getting out. The U.S. Embassy in Israel is staying in Tel Aviv, for now. President Trump signed a waiver to delay moving the embassy to Jerusalem, which he promised to do during the campaign. The White House says the embassy will move eventually, and the delay is only to help negotiate a peace deal between the Israelis and Palestinians, which hinges, in large part, on the status of Jerusalem. The Dakota Access Pipeline began shipping oil between North Dakota and Illinois for the first time today. President Trump greenlit the project during his first week in office, after months-long protests by Native American groups and environmental activists. Citing concerns about water contamination, four tribes are still fighting in court to shut down the pipeline, which has already leaked at least twice. The company behind the project, Energy Transfer Partners, says Dakota Access is, quote, one of the safest pipelines ever built and does not threaten Standing Rock's water supply. At an economic forum, President Vladimir Putin said that private Russian citizens, though not the government, could have been responsible for cyber attacks on the American election system. But a report from the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security last December outlined in extensive detail how the Russian government works with civilian hacker groups to undermine foreign elections. The Philippine government says 10 soldiers were killed in, quote, friendly fire during airstrikes that were targeting ISIS-linked militants in Marawi. The military is in its 10th day of its offensive against the rebels, and President Rodrigo Duterte has declared martial law. At least 19 civilians, 39 troops, and 120 rebels have been killed. Federal safety inspectors issued citations to Wisconsin's Didion milling plant back in 2011. Six years before, an explosion at the corn mill killed at least one worker on Wednesday night. OSHA inspectors flagged that workers were being exposed to fire and explosion hazards. The plant paid a fine of $3,500 and promised to correct the problem. The case was closed in 2013. Thus, as of today, the United States will cease all implementation of the non-binding Paris Accord and the draconian financial and economic burdens the agreement imposes on our country. And with that, Donald Trump pulled the United States out of the most comprehensive climate deal in the history of the planet and the best hope of limiting continued global warming. Trump spent most of the 28-minute Rose Garden speech talking about economics. The Paris Climate Accord is simply the latest example of Washington entering into an agreement that disadvantages the United States to the exclusive benefit of other countries, leaving American workers who I love and taxpayers to absorb the cost. But when he did talk about the Paris Agreement, he was almost entirely wrong. Even if the Paris Agreement were implemented in full, with total compliance from all nations, it is estimated it would only produce a two-tenths of one degree, think of that, this much. Actually, the Paris Climate Agreement wasn't going to reduce global temperatures at all. The goal was always to cap the rise in global warming at two degrees Celsius. And even that goal meant coming to terms with a future in which tidal areas disappear, climate refugees are a daily part of life, and food and water scarcity could lead to greater violence between people and countries. Paris was hardly optimistic. India will be allowed to double its coal production by 2020. Think of it. India can double their coal production. We're supposed to get rid of ours. Actually, India has canceled plans to build nearly 14 gigawatts of coal-fired power stations. Claims of China getting a better deal are just as baseless. But that's not even the point. Part of the reason 194 other parties signed on to the Paris Agreement is that it doesn't actually require any of them to do anything specific. They each got to pick their own path to reaching their commitments. So if the United States wanted to, for example, double coal output and quadruple solar, it could do that. It would break the pledge, but there are no consequences for breaking it. The entire agreement is a giant global pinky promise in which everybody tries to do the right thing for the planet. 
As the Wall Street Journal wrote this morning, the reality is that withdrawing is in America's economic interest and won't matter much to the climate. The numbers are pretty simple. If the U.S. doesn't drastically reduce its current carbon output, it'll be responsible for an additional 0.3 degrees Celsius of global warming by 2100. And it's not like other countries could simply pull more weight. According to a study in Nature Climate Change, any delay from the United States makes the overall target of limiting warming to 2 degrees unreachable. You can say it was a job speech. You can say it was a brilliant tactical speech that will allow Trump to renegotiate for terms that benefit Americans. And some Trump supporters will say that. What you can't say is that Trump's speech was fluent in the facts of the very agreement he's pulling out of. The United States pulling out of the agreement won't stop it from going forward. At least three world leaders have already come out to reject the idea of renegotiating Paris. In speaking alongside German Chancellor Angela Merkel this morning, Chinese Premier Li Keqiang affirmed his country's commitment to the agreement. It was a powerful visualization of how Trump's America First agenda is bringing America's competitors closer to each other. And for the Americans who helped hammer out the deal, it's a gut punch. Todd Stern served as special envoy for climate change during the Obama administration. Evan McMorris Santoro spoke to him earlier today. I mean, I guess my question is, aren't you just kind of bummed out? Well, I'm not happy, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I guess two things. First of all, I don't think it's the end of the Paris Agreement. I really don't. You know, I, I, I noted uh, what Trump said during the campaign, uh, which was, I'm going to cancel the Paris Agreement. And I wrote a, a short piece saying, you're actually not going to cancel the Paris Agreement because you don't have the power to, can, uh, to cancel the, the Paris Agreement, even assuming you win this election because there's 195 countries and it's not going to fall apart. It's really bad for the United States to pull out, don't get me wrong, but, uh, but the Paris Agreement is going to survive. Is it, it doable without the United States federal government involved? It, it's doable without the United States federal government involved for a few years. <laughs> Okay. Right? I mean, in the short run, this is not going to kill us, but it's certainly going to be unhelpful. We are making changes, but we aren't making them fast enough. I mean, the game here is to accelerate the pace. It's not help. It's absolutely not helpful to have, uh, to have the U.S. federal government kind of taking a walk on this. A lot of Trump's voters and Trump supporters are skeptical of this agreement. It's a very partisan issue in this country. Do you feel like people who advocate for climate change uh, are doing something wrong. Part of this has to do with messengers as well as message. Treat people as though they're ignorant when they have reservations about climate change uh, or aren't sure about it. And just say, you know, it, the debate's over, what's the matter with you? Sort of, sort of like, what, what's with you? I mean, when that's, the, when that's what's radiating out from, from an interlocutor, you're not going to you're not going to win anybody over. But what does it say to you that China is staying in this thing? It says to me that that China knows this is a big big deal and it's not going to go away. And I think all countries know that it, that that again. What is the undeniable fact that you can't wish away climate change? You can't wish away climate change. They don't want us out, uh, but they're going to take advantage of extra leadership role that people uh, that, that that they're going to have and that people are going to look at them uh, for. And I think China's going to step up. China's going to play a leadership role. But people want the United States to be in the game, and they want the United States to be in the game the way they understand the United States historically to be in the game as a country. With, uh, that cares about its reputation and its standing, that acts with honor, and, uh, and is, you know, as, Madam, as Madeleine Albright said, the indispensable nation. That's what the United States has been. That's what we're, that's what we're squandering right now. You know, that's, what the, that's what the president and his team have decided they don't care about. What's motivating the administration to pull out of the Paris Agreement is the potential to keep a major campaign promise bringing jobs back to coal country. But the demand for coal is already drying up. Next week, the last coal plant in New England will close down. And in the Trump stronghold of Adams County, Ohio, two more are on the way out. The jobs will be lost when two power plants close next year in Adams County. Adams County leaders have some tough choices to make in the coming months because of a potential loss of $8 million in tax revenue. 
It's all because of the announced closing of the Killen and Stewart electric generating power stations along the Ohio River. Every day I get up around five o'clock, get myself ready for work. I work at the Dayton Power and Light Killen Station. I've been there pretty much my whole adult life. I started up there right after I turned 21 years old. My job's paperwork, computer work, unloading trucks, forklift. Amen. The power plant's pretty much all I know. I'm 56 years old and I'm, I'm gonna lose my job here in, in around 14 months. And I'm not sure what I'm gonna do. It's just so scary to think about having to go to another job. I mean, no disrespect to McDonald's because I'll work at McDonald's if that's what it takes to get health insurance. But I don't know how I'll be with the public after working such a close setting in a man's world. It's gonna be a lot different for me. It scares me to think of what's gonna to happen to the communities because Dayton Power and Light is the biggest workforce in the community. Good seeing you. All you right. take care. Have a good day. See you, Wayne. We have recently learned that uh, DPNL has elected to uh, exit Adams County, and um, and we're quite fearful on what this will mean to our local economy. Dayton Power and Light has two coal-fired plants uh, right here on the Ohio River. The 700 jobs to a small community of 28,000 people is significant. What it means to Adams County is we are estimating about $35 million in salaries. They also pay $9 million in property taxes to our local county. Once that leaves, that will represent about 30% of the total property tax budget in Adams County. They're really pulling out $50 million out of this uh, local economy. Everybody is trying their best to overcome the catastrophe that's headed our way. So I'm hoping and praying that the powers that be in Columbus will sympathize with us. Yep. We can do all we can do down here, but we really need their help in this. We may be just a small drop in a big bucket, but we're still somebody. I didn't vote for Hillary or for Donald Trump. I voted for God. I wrote God in because I figure he's the only one that's going to be able to save us. We have about 935 students pre-K through 12. When the plants close, we would lose about five and a half million dollars out of what was an 11 million dollar budget. So <clears throat> if we lose 50 percent of our funding stream, we're simply insolvent. When you lose that percentage of your revenue, you're just simply dead in the water. You can't make enough cuts or adjustments to run on that kind of a budget and still maintain uh, the minimum standards that we are supposed to maintain for our boys and girls. This is Stewart Station. I've worked here about 14 years. I'm a power plant operator chemist as my job title. Um, I take care of the water quality here at the plant. Right now, I mean, there's a lot of unknown in the community and there's a lot of worry. I've got a fourth grader that comes home and that's what the kids are talking about at school. Is, um, dad, you know, are, are they gonna sh they're gonna shut down the plant. What are we gonna do? If the school loses all of its funding, loses the, the arts, the music, the athletics, there's already talks of teachers being laid off, after school programs being cut. Looking at my kids and what's best for them, I, I probably need to leave the community. How's school? Good. And nobody wants to. I mean, this is home. Nobody wants to leave home, so. 
A lot of the people thought with Donald Trump's presidency that they would save coal. The coal plants are going to be saved. I don't know that the, um, you know, who was our president mattered one way or the other. We've reached out to Trump through letters, Twitter, those types of things, and Trump has never responded in any way. We were told when they announced that the plant was closing that Trump couldn't save us. So I, I don't believe he can. I believe it's too far gone. For me, I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know if I'll get to keep my house. My children have offered me a place to live, but you know, I've worked for this and, and I wanna retire in my home. So I'm afraid, I'm afraid and I'm sad at the same time. The looming general election in the UK, now just seven days away, was supposed to be a romp for the Tories. It might not turn out that way. Polls show the race narrowing much more than Prime Minister Theresa May anticipated. And she's got no one to blame but herself. One thing you can say about this election, the post-mortems are going to be fun. What they'll chiefly be investigating is how a previously invulnerable politician screwed things up. The whole reason Theresa May called this election was because she was so certain she was going to smash it. So, what happened? Well, put simply, May's campaign was going to plan until she showed her plans for running the country. After a trouble-free month, she published her manifesto, at the heart of which was a scheme to make elderly people needing care pay for it with their own homes. What was swiftly labelled a dementia tax caused the uproar, not least among wealthy retirees, who just happened to be the people most likely to vote Conservative. The impact was immediate, not so much a policy as a piece of political self-harm, and within days May had dumped it. Isn't this U-turn really just a cynical attempt to stop voters leaving you in droves? <laughs> Look, first of all, let's be clear. We have not changed the principles that we set out in the manifesto. Neither her polling nor her standing has recovered. These unforced errors have been made against Labour's Jeremy Corbyn, a leader who's the king of the unforced error. How much will it cost to provide unmeans-tested childcare for 1.3 million children? Um, it will cost... Um... It's, it's quite troubling. This is a policy you're launching today, Mr Corbyn, and you don't know how much it's going to cost. Adjust the polls for who's actually going to bother voting and May will still wake up on June the 9th as Prime Minister. Whereas for the people around Corbyn, the key question is whether Labour's losses will be respectable enough for them to stave off yet another leadership challenge. But she's fumbled an easy election and exposed one of her chief weaknesses. May scores when she promises to deliver Brexit, a policy she opposed but which was imposed on her by the public. Her own policies have been her undoing. May campaigns as a leader while only winning by promising to do what she's been told. Today, more than 100 of the world's most powerful businessmen, financiers and politicians assembled in Chantilly, Virginia for the annual Bilderberg meeting. Bilderberg is a sinister conspiracy of the global elite designed to amplify the power of big business and to create a new world order that will replace national democracies with one world government. Indeed, since the Bilderberg meeting started in 1954, the cabal has, among other things, concocted a secret plan to use American and British intelligence agencies to topple the Shah of Iran and replace him with the Ayatollah Khomeini, orchestrated the US invasion of Iraq, handpicked Barack Obama to be the president of the United States, and, arranged for extraterrestrials to be given an island in French Polynesia from which they could monitor the behavior of Earthlings. But only according to the internet. In reality, Bilderberg is a three-day conference where powerful people meet to stroke other powerful people. It's like Davos, just more opaque. No record of the proceedings has ever been made public, which is just part of the reason it's a favorite target of conspiracy theorists, including Alex Jones. The belief that Bilderberg is full of puppet masters is far too flattering. In the year since the last conference was held at the Taschenberg Palais in Dresden, Germany, the US elected the ultimate anti-globalization president, and the UK voted to leave the European Union. It's almost like Bilderberg has no power at all. Or maybe that's just what they want us to think. 
Hi, we're Beach Fossils. Hello. If you find a reason, I'll be gone in a matter of time. It's just one of those songs that as soon as it started coming together, it, it just felt really right. When we sit down to write a song, usually I just like to start on bass because I feel like that's a good foundation for the song in general, it's just a really good backbone. We would come up with like a riff or something that works. And then, you know, one of us would be like, oh, I hear what the guitar could be doing here. So the beat for St. Ivy, um, I guess you were playing in the stu in the studio. Yeah, yeah. And it, it goes like it's like. The whole time in the studio, like when we were trying to get the drum sounds, we were referencing like, you know, DJ Shadow and like Wu Tang. So we were just trying to like mic the drums and record the drums to sound the same way they did on those old records. We booked like a trio in LA like the night before we were going into the studio and they started playing it and I, I literally started crying yeah, because totally. it, it worked and it sounded so good. I was like, I can't believe we actually pulled this off. This guy who played flute and he just came in and for like an hour or less and just like, we were like, just go crazy. We ended up kind of like chopping it up the way you kind of would chop up like a sampled drum beat or something. We yeah. would take like a piece from, from this run that he did on it and then put it into like a different piece and just kind of chop that up together. And yeah. Yeah, it, was, it turned out pretty cool. Yeah. We were just playing what, what we like and what we were listening to, you know? It was just a byproduct of us collaborating. This is what the sound was. I think that's what came out. Yeah. That's Vice News Tonight for Thursday, June 1st. Tune in tomorrow night for the award-winning documentary series, Vice. How much longer do you think you'll be fighting for? Allah <laughs> Have you ever killed someone? Wow. Oh my God, what's that?